Welcome to church. We are so glad that you could join us. Hope this service will bless and encourage you. Before we get into a time of worship, uh, let's read a passage from the Bible, Psalms chapter 43, verses 3 to 5. Let's read. Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre. O God, my God, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You cannot go a day without hope. We sleep hoping that we wake up, and we wake up hoping for a good day. Hope is such an essential driver of life. That's why you should put that hope in God. In these uncertain times, He's the only unshakable rock, the solid rock you can always rely on. So whenever you're feeling low, just praise Him. Let Him be your delight. Ask Him to lead you. He is definitely faithful enough to lead you. Let's get into our time of worship. God bless. Hey everyone, welcome to church. We're gonna worship together. So if you wanna stand, we're gonna sing these songs of praise and worship to our God. So let's do it.
thank you father thank you lord for this time of worship we praise you father we exalt your name lord jesus we glorify your name lord jesus lord we bow down before you we praise you father because all we have all we are lord jesus we owe it all to you father lord uh, there is nothing that happens in this world without your knowledge father i pray that your lord jesus your divine protection surround us father lord i pray for peace around this world father let there be no fighting lord uh, let your peace surround each country lord jesus let there be brotherhood among men lord jesus thank you father thank you lord lord even now i pray for all the all the lonely all the depressed at this moment lord jesus i pray for your divine comfort lord jesus let them realize that there is a compassion god who takes care of them lord jesus let there be let there be divine protection lord jesus lord i pray for everyone who around this world who's watching this service right now lord i pray uh, lord jesus i pray a prayer of blood covering around their families i pray a bread, prayer of blood covering around their relationships lord jesus let them be protected lord jesus at all times lord i pray uh, let relationships be strengthened lord jesus relationship between husband and wife relationship between parents and children well, lord jesus all kind of relationships lord jesus let them be protected lord jesus i pray for uh, all the families who has lost who have lost a loved one at this time lord jesus lord uh, we do not understand their pain but lord jesus i pray that you comfort them lord jesus lord i pray for everyone who has lost a job at this moment but lord you give them the divine guidance you give them uh, you you be their provider lord jesus we look up to you jehovah chaira our provider our provision comes from you father thank you father thank you lord for filling our homes lord jesus with peace lord jesus thank you father lord even now i pray for all the financial needs of all the families lord jesus lord let them be met for lord jesus i pray for um uh, taking right decisions lord jesus i pray for wisdom to uh, to take the right decisions lord jesus at this uh, at this time lord i pray for uh, children especially lord jesus even as, as they are attending online classes lord uh, let them be lord jesus let them learn uh, lord jesus let them be let there be no impairment in their learning due to this online classes lord jesus let them fully learn Lord Jesus and let them be protected from all kinds of abuses Lord Jesus I pray let your divine blood covering be upon these people Lord Jesus everyone Lord Jesus I pray Lord Jesus I pray this in Jesus name
Hi Church, what a joy and privilege it is to share God's word with you all today. As you know, we've been doing the Holy Spirit series, which is Ruach, the breath of God. And today we're going to be looking at how the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The verse we're going to be looking at is John chapter 16, verses 13. And this is what it says. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is to come. We're living in a time when a lot of young people say this uh, common usage. You know, they use this phrase which says, uh, I'm living my truth. And so what it actually means is I'll do whatever I want. Anything goes. Don't ask me questions because this is my truth. The, the joke is that the real truth is out there and that truth is embodied in the person of Jesus. And so today when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about him being the spirit of truth because according to this verse, it says he will guide us into all truth, which means the pursuit of truth is a lifelong process. And gradually as we get to know our Lord more and more, the Holy Spirit guides us, you know, every step of the way, teaching us what's right, what's wrong exposing parts of our life where there is falsity and and really basically guiding us every step of the way. That's what he says here. He will guide you into all truth. You know, the minute we are saved, if he exposes all the truth of everything to us, it will just be a huge load. We can't bear it. So it's a lifelong process. The second thing he says is he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he has heard. The spirit of God reveals the heart of God. That's a very important thing. And that's how we know the truth about certain things. And the third thing it says that he will tell you what is to come. He speaks of our future. I want to ask you, you know, when I was meditating on this verse, it really got me thinking. As to God, you know what? I'm not actually harnessed the Holy Spirit as he deserves to be harnessed, as he deserves to be used in my life. I have literally had him on the sidelines and used him, used him as I saw fit. But I didn't incorporate him and just infuse him completely into my life. And so today, as we step into this, this study, my desire for each of us is that we will open our lives up, drop the facade. We will drop our walls and say, you know what, Lord, I want your Holy Spirit, all of him. Reveal the truth about my life. Reveal the areas which are so false that I've tricked myself into believing it's the truth. Only the Holy Spirit does that. And I want you to relax and believe this, that this is not an exercise where the Holy Spirit wants you to be embarrassed or ashamed, not at all. His purposes are higher than what we understand. All he wants to do is to come in, speak to us, help us, guide us. That's his desire. So even as we get into this, I want us to remember that, you know, this whole passage about the Holy Spirit and what he longs to do, all of it is contingent on us giving him access. If we don't ask him in, if we don't say, Lord, Come in spirit of truth, work in me, work on me. If we don't give him that access, he's not going to be able to do what he does. Someone once said that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He doesn't come in where he's not invited. He waits for us to invite him in. I want to ask you today, are you asking the Holy Spirit for this? What does the Holy Spirit look like to you? Is he the spirit of truth? I want us to take a few seconds just to settle ourselves down and to ask God, Lord, reveal things in my life. Reveal those things which I've deceived myself with. Reveal those opinions which are clearly false, but I've believed it's true. Work on the things that I've believed about you, God, that are false. Work on that. Can we ask God to do that? Father, we just pray, even as we get into your word, that you will speak to each of us. Each of us would come before you with honesty, Lord. And be open to what you are going to do in our lives, spirit of truth. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we, we all have so many opinions. In my family, um, my whole family, all of us are very opinionated. And I very graciously pass that on to my children. So all of us are extremely opinionated about something or the other. So, you know, and, and I notice in my husband's family too, there are a lot of opinions that they have. So Combined, we are a very opinionated family. And so we have opinions on everything from vaccines to theology to the rapture. You name it, we have an opinion on it. But the truth of the matter is this. When the spirit of truth is part of our lives, when the Holy Spirit is part of our lives, he brings truth to those opinions. And so we need to be open to the fact that he's going to change those opinions. We need to be open that he will correct our theology. We need to be open to the fact that the things we think our education has taught us and we know for a fact by logic 
is is the right thing he probably is going to come and change that because he is the spirit of truth so today i want us to look at the life of king david because he is someone that i have been when i have studied the bible what i find about him is when it comes to him and the holy spirit they're just one and you know david was called a man after god's own heart and i truly believe that's because David was so anointed by the spirit of God that he just knew what God expected of him. He was so knit together with the heavenly father and so therefore I want to look at King David today and and see what his life can teach us about allowing the spirit of truth to work in us. But before we look at King David, I want to look at a contrasting character and that's King Saul. So now you probably know the story of Saul if you don't Saul was the first king of Israel he was chosen because the people demanded for a king they told Samuel the prophet enough we want a king like the other nations and this displeased God but still God in his kindness anoints Saul for the job and Saul was physically imposing a head taller than everyone else and he was a good ruler to begin with he was anointed by God and he had incredible strengths but unfortunately over two big instances Saul actually disobeyed God blatant outright disobedience and because of those two incidences God rejects him and God rejects his dynasty so there is he says i don't want your family to rule over israel and i don't want you as king anymore that was what those two instances led to what were the two instances the first time was when Saul was supposed to go into battle with the philistines and Samuel had told him to wait for 7 days until Samuel came and helped him offer the sacrifice now what happened was Saul got jittery because Samuel was nowhere to be seen and the the sacrifices are waiting to be offered and the people are starting to wander off you know fear of losing his people drove him to instead take the sacrifice and offer it himself and right after he sacrifices talk about bad timing Samuel walks in and Samuel says what you've done has displeased God And so the second occasion where Saul actually messes up was a couple of years later when he's asked by God expressly asked you need to annihilate the Amalekites okay that was the instruction kill everyone from the greatest from the king the royalty to the animal the livestock everything has to go and here Saul you know um in in I, I honestly i felt sorry for Saul when i studied this i felt like you know what i can relate to Saul on some level so Saul does what was asked he does kill the men and the women and the, and he was about to kill the king but he retains the choicest livestock and other things and then Samuel comes to him and says you know what this time god's really upset with you because he does not want a sacrifice of rams in use instead he's looking for obedience he's looking for a king who will obey him and you are not that king and so god outright rejects him and says i've chosen someone else a neighbor to you who's a man after my own heart he's going to be king in your place now when you look at how saul reacts to the correction on his life it's a lot like each of us which is why i think i had so much of empathy for him saul justifies his actions he says you know what but i did exactly what you said he explains it away he says i i did what you said but then i i thought i'll do a bit extra you know i thought i will keep some stuff to sacrifice for god he lies he he covers it up he tries to make it make the situation look better than it actually is and the sad thing was that his partial obedience was actually complete disobedience in the eyes of god and so that's how Saul reacted to correction and and i don't know about you but i could re- relate to that so often i minimized sin in my life I've minimized what I've done. I've made it look like it's not such a big deal. I've explained it away. I've justified it. So much like Saul right there, but I don't think that's the response that is required of us. Those of us who know the Lord, our response has to be very different when we're confronted by the truth. And so let's look at King David. Let's look at what David was about. You look at David. David was a young shepherd boy chosen from the fields around Bethlehem. He was anointed and he was called and given the throne and he had to wait a long time before he became the king but when he did become king god did some amazing amazing things in his life but david did have fatal flaws he did have kings in the armor so to speak he was not perfect far from it actually and so what david does is once he's completely well settled in his uh, kingship he makes two huge mistakes one towards the beginning of his uh 
career as a king and one towards the end of his career the first mistake he makes was in the case of Bathsheba okay so but Bathsheba was the wife of one of his mighty men Uriah and Bathsheba was this woman who was exceedingly beautiful had a bath in the uh, open right next to his palace talk about enticing a man and David who was supposed to be at war was on the terrace and he fell a prey to this this uh, lustful proposition and david sinned david slept with her and a child comes out of that union and so david doesn't stop there he decides to drag the deception out what does he do he calls uriah in from the field and says uriah was at ba- in battle at the time he says come home and he tries to set them up so that it look like it's uriah's child but that doesn't work and then david resorts to the next thing which is murder he gets him assassinated in the battle front Okay now David thought he had covered all fronts he had closed up all the holes he was safe but then God sends Nathan the prophet and speaks to him and he says hey guess what you have sinned you have displeased God and the child that is born to you now is going to die and David you know his response is just is beautiful because he first falls before God and he says i have sinned against God yes he did he sin against Uriah did he sin against Bathsheba yes but he also acknowledged primarily that he had sinned against god and then he cries out for the child and what happens is that the child does die and nathan doesn't stop there he speaks over his family line he says what you did in secret people close to you are going to do it in public and that's what happens because few years down the line absalom does that to him david's repentance was instantaneous and was deeply genuine it wasn't a it wasn't drama it wasn't just you know face value it was the real thing fast forward many years it's the end of david's lifetime and all of a sudden it says that the enemy incited david and asked him to take a census of the people now what does this indicate david knew his fighting men he had mighty men he had uh, an army which was filled with men who were exceptional in war but yet towards the end of his life it's probably that he lost a bit of faith maybe he thought i need to check whether i still have my you know military might of of days of old or maybe he just thought you know what maybe i need to you know ramp up my military uh, strength we don't know what incited him to do it maybe it was a sense of pride let me see how much i actually have and see what i've accomplished all these years we don't know what it was but again it really triggered god's anger towards him and the people of the land and so god sends word to him through gad the prophet and this time again he says straight up you've sinned you missed the mark and so here's the options i give you three options this is what the prophet tells him he says i give you three options choose your punishment and so david picks the punishment that he says you know what i'd rather fall under the hands of god than against people so he chooses that the land would go through a plague for 3 days and that's what happens a terrible plague ravages the land and 70000 israelites die that in the over the course of the next 3 days and on the third day the angel of death is over a particular spot when the lord relents and stops him and you know what david's response to that is he rushes to the spot where the angel of death was at last and he goes there and he buys that field from the person who owned it and he sets up an altar and he worships god he does the same thing after his son is dead too with bathsheba when he hears that his child has died he cleans up he worships god that is david's response to correction so when you look at the two men saul and david it's very interesting they were both kings they were both anointed by god what was the difference I think fundamentally the difference was this Saul did not have a personal relationship with God. He needed Samuel to always be the mediator. He needed Samuel there like his crutch. He seemed to have not got the confidence to approach God directly. He needed Samuel to be the front. You know and say you know what Samuel come and stand with me while I worship. Don't let me down in front of the elders. So worship with me. Offer the sacrifices with me. After Samuel's time, you know, after Samuel dies, Saul's left bereft of a counselor and so he starts to go and talk to a necromancer a medium and says you know what call up the spirit of Samuel for me that's how dependent Saul was on a mediator he needed someone to stand in the gap for him and intercede for him 
he didn't realize that he was the king of israel he had direct access to this jehovah god he could have just spoken up and he would have heard him he always needed a mediator but as david had this different approach he didn't need anyone to stand in the gap for him he had direct access to his father he wrote songs of out of his few, out of the futile seasons of his life he wrote it when he was joyous he wrote it when he was broken he wrote it when he was on the run from enemies such an open relationship with his god so that's the fundamental difference Saul no relationship with god david a very deep relationship with god Saul needed a mediator david didn't need anyone Saul was a people pleaser he needed the people's validation in order to feel like he was actually accomplishing something but as david said i will become even more undignified than this in his worship of his god he didn't care about who was around him who was watching none of that it was him and his audience of one this was the two kings the first two kings of israel who reigned who had successful long reigns but there was great differences in their lives and so the beauty of david's life is this you know when you read the psalms you need to look at it from an angle not of a rant of a crazy man but actually the the uh, expression of a man who was incredibly close to god and so he knew god's heart why because he had the spirit of god in his life he knew exactly what was on god the father's heart he knew what was to come because the holy spirit was prophesying through him there are many messianic psalms which were written about Jesus how did david know that it was because of the holy spirit in him so we're looking at uh, one of the writings of david in particular which was psalm 51 which is a lament so after he sinned and he was reproached he writes this psalm and it's a beautiful psalm because it expresses to us exactly what god's heart is towards us his people and so i want to take our attention to psalm 51 verse 6 and this is what it says behold you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part of my heart you will make me know wisdom so the first thing we need to remember here is that god desires truth in the innermost parts we're so good with the superficial we're so good with what everyone sees and sometimes even that with a filter or with a you know a bit of editing we can cover that up but god desires truth in the innermost part that's what it says so that's the first thing about god that we see from this psalm the second thing is Psalm 51 verse 16 to 17 it says for you do not delight in sacrifice or else i would give it you are not pleased with burnt offering my only sacrifice to god is a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart broken with sorrow for sin thoroughly penitent such o god you will not despise god desires a truly repentant heart not someone who just does you know goes through the you know motions of repentance just says you know i'm sorry not someone who needs a mediator to say sorry to and you know just sometimes we feel if i just confide you know what i did to someone i'm sorted god wants us to directly come to him because it says come boldly to the throne of grace come before him and repent before him he is looking for a genuinely repentant heart and of course the spirit of god searches all things and so the holy spirit in us will enable us to repent in the way that pleases god the holy spirit within us will search the innermost parts of our being and reveal the areas where truth is lacking if you're wondering how am i going to do that not to worry that's what ruach does that's what the breath of god does that is what the spirit of god does his very job in our lives is to work in the deepest parts of us because a lot of times when someone says you know or when when they talk about this innermost parts we don't know what the innermost parts are we don't remember what happened in our lives 20 years back we don't know what has corrupted our soul we don't know the things that have shaped us in ways we didn't even know were shaped but the holy spirit does and so we need to invite him in so that he can create truth in the innermost parts he will take out what is false and he will reveal truth in those places that he will give us a truly repentant heart that's what the holy spirit does and so i want us to be, remember just these two things if you don't remember anything from today this is what i believe the spirit of truth wants to do in each of our lives when we looked at both the men of god that we talked about saul and david we did notice that in david there was genuine conviction he genuinely repented he felt terrible for what he did whereas with 
King Saul, we didn't notice that. We didn't notice this feeling of him saying, oh, I messed up before God. Lord, forgive me. That conversation never happens with Saul. But with David, you hear it again and again and again. And so I believe that the first thing the spirit of truth wants to do in our lives is he wants to convict us. Let me explain that a bit. Convict does not mean condemn. He does not want to condemn us because Jesus himself said, I have come not to condemn you, but to save you. The son of man comes not to condemn, but to save. So when God convicts us through the Holy Spirit's work, it is not to point out at every error in our life, but instead to bring us to a place of conviction and say, you know what, this is not fitting with someone who knows the Lord now. This particular trait of mine can't be something that I, I dwell on. I need to let it go. This addiction, which is so deeply embroiled in whom I am, Holy Spirit, I'm feeling so convicted about it. You need to sort it out. That's what conviction does. I want us to look at John chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. This is what it says. And he, when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin and the need for a savior and about righteousness and about judgment, about sin and the true nature of it, because they do not believe in me and my message about righteousness, personal integrity and godly character, because I am going to my father and you will no longer see me about judgment, the certainty of it, because the ruler of this world, Satan, has been judged and condemned. So from this verse, what do we see that the Holy Spirit is convicting of? He convicts us of sin, the true nature of it. No more can we explain it away or hide it or pretend, you know, you can't see it. No more. Because when the Holy Spirit comes in, the spirit of truth comes in, he convicts us of sin. He calls black, black. He doesn't mince words with us. And if there's a, a, a deep-rooted unbelief in Jesus, the Holy Spirit will convict you of that. That's sin. According to this, unbelief in Jesus equals sin. If you don't consider Jesus the Son of God as the Lord of your life, it's a sin. That's what he's saying. And he convicts you of that. The second thing that the Holy Spirit convicts you about is righteousness, moral integrity, godly character. So often, you know, we don't want to talk about morality within the church because we say that's not for us. I mean, we want to talk about spiritual things. You know what? The, the, the demonstration of the spiritual is in how we live our lives on a daily basis. It's in how I treat my spouse. It's in how I behave with my children. It's in how I treat my family, my extended family, in how I treat the help, in how I run my life in private. That is what counts. And the Holy Spirit is at work in us, shaping that righteousness because we are already standing righteous before God, thanks to Jesus and his blood on that cross. But still, there are areas in our life which are deeply flawed and the Holy Spirit, thank God for him, works to convict us of those failings. The third thing that he convicts us about is judgment. The impending judgment, the second coming of Jesus, it's imminent. He is returning. He's not coming as a baby. He's coming as a righteous judge. There's no two ways about that. And so how are we living today? Do we live with the understanding that the second coming is near, that he is returning? And so I better be busy about the work that he has set out for me. No more am I going to be lackadaisical and saying, you know what, I can just relax. I'm saved, saved forever. He has work for us. He wants us to do the things required of us until he returns. So that, that those are the things that the Holy Spirit convicts us about. He brings conviction. He doesn't condemn us. You know, when you watch these movies, um, where there's a prisoner who's in a court courtroom and then, you know, he, there's a jury and they convict him. What happens is that when he's convicted, he stands, he gets the conviction laid on him and they say, you know, these are the counts uh, and you're charged under this, uh, you know, code. And now you're they're arresting him and they take him away. And what happens from being in a crowded courtroom, he's now abandoned and put into a jail or a correctional facility where he's literally abandoned by the legal system and his family and all those he loves. But the beauty of, you know, being a Christian is knowing this, that the Holy Spirit convicts me, but he doesn't abandon me. He cleanses me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't leave me, you know, just say, you know what, now you belong to the system, get lost. You're, you're too damaged for me. Not a chance. Not a chance. He, in fact, convicts us. And the next step that he does is he cleanses us. And this cleansing is a lifelong thing. It doesn't just happen on one occasion. 
throughout our lives it's called sanctification it's it's a process called sanctification where every single day we are being renewed you know these things that are false in our lives the things that are not of god when they get revealed the holy spirit says hey you know what if you let me i'll cleanse you of this and how does the cleansing happen let's look at titus chapter 3 verses 3 to 7 and this is what it says once we too were foolish and disobedient we were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures our lives were full of evil and envy and we hated each other but when god our savior revealed his kindness and love he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done but because of his mercy he washed away our sins giving us a new birth a new life through the holy spirit He generously poured out the spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our savior because of his grace he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life so from this you know that we were all sinners each one of us were sinners it says we were misled we were slaves to many lusts and pleasures isn't that the truth let's not fool ourselves we can fool others but we can't fool ourselves all of us have had a background of this but it says when god our savior revealed his kindness and love how did he reveal it through jesus when he sent jesus to us he revealed his love and kindness towards us and he has washed us because of his mercy not because of anything you and i did to deserve it it's just purely his mercy he generously pours out the holy spirit on us and because of his grace he has made us right in his sight and given us confidence and so today i want you to come to this secure place that you don't have to be afraid of the truth anymore the truth doesn't have to be this looming shadow over your life you know the, the, we have so many titles that come with the truth we have the ugly truth we have uh, the inconvenient truth the uncomfortable truth all these phrases which have come up hey but you know what jesus is the way the truth and the life when he brings truth into your life he does it for your good he does it not to condemn you but to convict you and he does it without abandoning you he embraces you close and the holy spirit cleanses you how does he cleanse us he gives us new birth it's a spiritual regeneration and transformation paul writes about how because of christ we are a new creation okay so it's literally like he washes us and creates a new person you know a fresh person and he reminds us that you know we're not saved because of our works we're saved because of the grace of god And so when you believe in Jesus this grace is afforded to you and now you are cleansed from your sins and the beauty is that now we stand faultless before the throne so you can be confident in this you know that even when the grime of your life the holy spirit shows it up to you you can say to it you know what i know that because of jesus i stand faultless before the throne and so lord forgive me for this sin Forgive me for this thing which is like a stain on me but I thank you that you blot out every transgression that's what David writes blot out my iniquity when you blot something it disappears completely and that's what God has done to us sins because of Jesus's work our sins are forgiven so today whatever your area of deception is maybe you've put up a good wall no one knows maybe people even in your church don't know what you do or what you're engaged in or what secret sins you have hidden very well in your life but the holy spirit knows and he wants to be invited in he is longing to be invited into our lives into even the mess because he says hey i want to convict you and i want to cleanse you and you know the beauty of this is you know the the word that comes right after that is he gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life he wants you to live with confidence the holy spirit does not want you to live condemned and in shackles and in shame he wants you to live free and confident that is his desire for us and so i want us to you know really look at this this whole teaching and come to a place of saying holy spirit i trust you i trust you with the mess i trust you with the private dirty parts of my life because i can't tell anyone about it lord but i can tell you you know and i believe i believe that god wants to raise a generation of us who are people after his own heart not just david he wants each of us to be people after his own heart he wants sons and daughters men and women who are after their his own heart and i believe that he wants that today if that is your desire if you're saying you know what i really desire to be a person after god's own heart 
I want to hear secrets from him. I want to know what's going to happen in the future. I want to walk in the confidence that comes from being a child of God. If you want that, I ask that you will invite the Holy Spirit in today, that you will say, Spirit of truth, cleanse me. Spirit of truth, convict me. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 11 says this, This is why the scriptures say things never discovered or heard of before, things beyond our ability to imagine. These are the many things God has in store for all his lovers. But God now unveils these profound realities to us by the Spirit. Yes, he has revealed to us his inmost heart and deepest mysteries through the Holy Spirit who constantly explores all things. After all, who can really see into a person's heart? and know his hidden impulses except for that person's spirit. So it is with God, his thoughts and secrets are on only fully understood by his spirit, the spirit of God. If you and I want to be people after God's own heart, we have to give room for the Holy Spirit. And when we give him room, like that first verse says, ask him, Lord, guide me into all truth. Show me the future, Lord. That's what your Holy Spirit has been given to me for. Show me the Father's heart. Whisper to me the things that the Father wants me to hear. Whisper to me the things that the Son wants me to hear. I want to hear from you. I want to have your heart. You know, imagine how different our businesses would be if we ran it with this perspective. Imagine how different our careers would be if we ran it with this thought. Imagine how different our homes would be if this is the perspective we looked at it with. And so I believe God wants to do a new thing in our lives. He wants us to come to a place of saying enough, enough of the deception, enough of those facades that don't make any sense anymore. I want truth, Lord. I want truth in my life. And if you're someone who's saying, but I don't know how to do it. What if I still mess up? What if I again go back into a pattern? Hey, this is what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit enabling us. Philippians 2 verse 13 says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That is the purpose of Ruach HaKodesh in your life. He wants to assist you. When you renounce all that is false, when you renounce the things that are not pleasing to him, he will enable you to do that which pleases God. So with this understanding, can you just close your eyes? And can I just pray over you that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. That he will speak truth into the deepest parts, the inmost parts of your life. That he will set you free from all that has been holding you bondage. Those secrets which threaten to destroy you, the Holy Spirit wants to set you free from today. The secrets which could damage your marriage irreparably, the Holy Spirit is saying, hand it over to me. I want to work in your life. I want to restore your marriage. Maybe those secrets from your childhood which are drowning you every time you close your eyes. The Holy Spirit is saying, hey, I love you so much. I want to restore you. I want to restore you today. Maybe the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to come into that logical mind of yours, your beautiful brain that I've given you. I want to change it. I want to put my truth into it so that you will speak the truth to others. Maybe that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Will you open up your hearts? Will you open up your minds? And when you let the Holy Spirit come in, some days I don't know how to love you Some days I don't know how to sing But if there's anything I know I know where, where I'm meant to be Some days I don't know what I'm bringing Some days I don't know what
Jesus, I thank you that we can come to your feet. We can come and simply learn from you. We can sit by your feet and hear your voice. When we read your word, we get to know you, what you're about, that your story is endless stories, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that we can freely sing, we can freely worship you, that we can be at your feet, we can weep, we can grieve, we can joyfully delight in you, Lord Jesus, all the things at your feet and worship. And so, Lord, as we continue to sing, would you take our worship, would you take our praise, would you take our adoration? This is all for you. We sing because of you. We raise our voice because of you, Lord God. We're alive because of you. Take our praise. So church, in this moment, if you're sat at home, why don't you stand? We're gonna sing, we're gonna praise our God because what, what more can we do? What better to do than worship and raise our voice and worship Him and give Him the glory. So join us as we sing. We're gonna sing this amazing song called The Stand and you've probably sung it a thousand times, but it's so powerful, these words. So come on, let's sing together, church. Come on, take it, Alex. So I'll stand with arms high and I'll abandon in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul on to you surrender.
Spirit of Truth, we pray that you will cleanse each one of us. Cleanse us, O Father. Cleanse every part of us. Thank you, Lord, that you showed us what you desire. Desire truth in the inmost parts. You desire, O Father, a true repentance. And so today, Lord, we come before you asking you to convict us of sin. Any sin, Lord, that has been displeasing to you. Convict us of it. Convict us, O Father, and cleanse us again. Cleanse us once again. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're going to keep working on our lives. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you are doing. We love you and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you're saying that, I don't know who Jesus is, but I think I may need him because my life feels like it's missing something important. I really do believe that Jesus is not the missing ingredient. He's everything. Jesus is the son of God and he was sent to earth by his father with the express purpose of saving the world because we were drowning in our sins. We were so messed up and Jesus was sent to earth to save us. How did he save us? He walked on earth, did so many miracles, healed many people, taught them a, a great deal of things and then he was crucified on a cross. He died a horrific death. But in victory, he rose from the grave on the third day. And because of that victory today, we have the hope of eternal life. So in following Jesus, we actually renounce our old ways. We accept him into our life. We accept him as the Lord and Savior. And our lives do change. Do things get plain and easy? Not always. It is a, a difficult road because every single day we die to ourselves. You know, things that don't please him, we need to put it away. We need to literally get rid of it. But following him has eternal rewards. It has rewards of eternal life with him. It has the rewards of an abundant life spiritually here on earth. And so I want to encourage you, if you have said, I, I have not said yes to Jesus all these years, but I've been hearing about him, or maybe you're saying this is the first time hearing about him. Can I encourage you to step into a relationship with this God? Because he's amazing. He changes lives. He changes lives in the best way possible. Can you repeat this prayer after me? Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to the earth. Thank you that he died for my sins. Forgive me of every sin. Cleanse my heart, Lord. I ask that Jesus become the Lord and Savior of my life today. I believe that Jesus rose again. I believe that I have hope for eternity because of that. I ask that the Holy Spirit will come in and transform my life and that he will continue to work in me until the day of your return. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I believe that this is just the beginning. You know, the spirit of truth wants to work in us for as long as we have breath in our bodies. He wants to work in us until the return of Jesus or until we reach eternity. And so will you on a constant basis, maybe, you know, every week, take some time, one hour a week, maybe, where you just sit alone in his presence and you say, Lord, convict me of things that I messed up in. Because so often we do and say things that we don't even realize we are messed up in. But if you just spend some time alone with him, we just play some quiet music. Sit quietly with him. It could be just half an hour, 45 minutes. Sit in his presence and say, Lord, Spirit of Truth, convict me, cleanse me. And you will find that your walk with him will be so amazing. And your life outside of that, you know, your going out, your coming in, your work life, your parenting life, your marriage, you will find it's so much more victorious, so much more abundant because of the Spirit of Truth moving so fast and deep in your life. So I pray that you will experience this. I pray that it will change your life. And I pray that you'll have an amazing week ahead. God bless you. We have a Zoom call every Sunday at 11 a.m. for children. If you have children below the age of 12, they are welcome to join us. If you need prayer or just someone to speak with, please contact us on this number. We would love to get in touch with you since we believe that when we pray together, there is power in agreement.
Seeking God every day is necessary in order for us to thrive and to be transformed. We as the church have published a few Bible plans on the YouVersion Bible app. All you have to do is to download the app and search for We Are Zion Chennai on it. You can do the plans alone or with your friends. A desire is that through doing these plans, you will develop a deep love for God and His Word. If you struggle to stay disciplined in your reading of the Bible regularly, we would love to do a plan with you and help you develop this life-changing discipline. Our sermon podcasts are available on your favorite streaming podcast platform. Make sure to search for Sermon Podcast We Are Zion. Our prayer is that as you listen to these podcasts, you will be blessed. Church, hope you enjoyed this service. We are available on all social media channels. So subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You have a great week ahead. And remember, whoever finds Jesus, finds life. எழிலுடன் எதையும் தாங்கும் அற்புத பாரதமே குழப்பத்துக்கும் அழிவுக்கும் நடுவே நீ அச்சமின்றி நிற்பாயாக அனைவரையும் சமமாய் அணைத்து கொண்டு ஒவ்வொரு உயிரையும் மதிப்பு மிக்கதாக உயர்த்துவாயாக பலவீனர்களும் வல்லமையற்றவர்களும் சிறப்பான கவனிப்பையும் மதிப்பையும் பெறுவார்களாக பலவான்களும் பணக்காரர்களும் தங்களை பிறருக்காக அர்ப்பணிப்பார்களாக கொள்ளை நோயிலிருந்து சுகமாகி உறுதியுடன் மீண்டு வருவாயாக உன் மக்கள் எப்பொழுதும் இல்லாத வகையில் விரைவில் எழுந்து நிமிறுவார்களாக எங்கள் பிள்ளைகள் சுதந்திரமாகவும் மகிழ்ச்சியுடன் ஓடி திரியட்டும் எங்கள் பெரியவர்கள் இளைஞர்களை பாதுகாப்பான புல்வெளிகளுக்கு நடத்தி செல்லட்டும் இளைஞர்களும் மத்திய வயதினரும் புதுமையையும் நம்பிக்கையையும் தங்களை பின்பற்றுபவர்களுக்கு வைத்துச் செல்வார்களாக நாங்கள் எங்கள் தனிப்பட்ட இருதயங்களை உயிர் தருபவரிடம் திருப்புவோமாக ஒரே நாடாக கடவுளுக்கு மகிமை தருபவர்களாக மாறுவோமாக ஏசு தம் வெளிச்சத்தை இந்த மகத்துவமான நிலத்துக்கு தந்து இன்னும் ஒரு முறை மறுமலர்ச்சியை தருவாராக